Well, once again, we want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to do something just a little different tonight. I uh, announced it last week that we were going to break from the study a little bit. Uh, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and uh, with that in mind, we're going to uh, look at some issues that Psalms 136 tells us that should draw our attention to thanking, thanking God. You know, the psalmist, uh, literally thousands of years ago, was thanking God for the same things you and I uh, should be thanking, thanking Him for today. And so uh, you're accustomed to me leaving blanks and writing in. Well, we're not doing that tonight either. A lot of change, aren't we? Uh, so I've already written it out. So first find Psalms 136 in your Bible. And for those of you that were at 7 o'clock, turn to Philippians chapter 4. You get a that a boy or that a girl, but uh, we're not there tonight. Okay, so let's go to Psalms 136, and the very first section we're going to look at is we need to give thanks for, for God's goodness. In verse 1 and 3, I'll give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. I'll give thanks unto God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. I'll give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endures endures forever. Uh, did you notice that in each one of those verses, the ending was His mercy enduring forever? And uh, the very first thing we're going to look at is the fact that God is good. Now that's the fundamental truth that has to be established before we can come to grips with the movement of God. Uh, unlike you and I where sometimes we uh, operate not out of goodness, but out of envy or spite or, or hatred or, or, or you, you add it, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get you. Uh, God's not that way. Everything that God does is good. Now, I know right away, as soon as I said that, there's somebody out there uh, that uh, in your spirit, you remember an event the last decade or or you, you've heard the story of, of something that happened in someone's life, and, and it wasn't good. The situation wasn't good. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is, God is always good. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says He's working all things to the good, that those who love God, those who have called according to His purpose. Uh, now, having said that, there's many events in our life that uh, don't appear good, and they really from the human perspective, aren't. Uh, let's don't shade away from that. Uh, but you know, there, there's people uh, that question God's goodness. And to question God's goodness means you've set your own standard for goodness. Because the Bible uses God as the standard for goodness. His mercy enduring forever. God is the stabilizer. He, he, he's the springboard, if you would. Anything less than that. So... Uh, you know, may I add that the one consistent thing of Scripture, uh, the one theme all through the, all, you know, all 66 books, is the truth that God is good. You know, but God also provides us mercy, uh, eternal mercy, and that endures forever, doesn't it? Uh, this phrase, His mercy endures forever, it, it's also recorded in First Chronicles, chapter 16 and verse 37 through 41. And that passage was sung twice a day during temple worship. And now if you recall, uh, the children of Israel, uh, there was daily worship in the temple. And so twice a day they would sing of God's mercy, God's goodness. Now God's goodness and mercy, if you get honest, are one of life's greatest wonders. Why would he be merciful to you and I when we're in complete rebellion uh, against him? Why would he be good to us uh, when all we want to do is position ourselves to benefit ourselves? Well, because he is his driving force, God's driving force, I'm speaking, is his goodness and his mercy. Uh, you know, uh, I thought about them singing uh, at the temple, you know, twice a day about God's mercy. Can you imagine the animal sacrifice and all the rules and regulations they were to keep? You know, they were living under the law. 
And it didn't seem like God was merciful. It seemed like God was demanding more and more and more. Oh, you've done that? Bring me a turtle dove. Oh, you've done that? Bring me a sheep. You, uh, oh, you've done that? Pay that guy back. You know, everything was rules and, and, and tough, uh, edgy, if you would. But the, even the people living under that legalistic system uh, grasp the truth that God's mercy endures forever. The Bible says it's by his mercy that he doesn't consume us. Uh, you know, God, God doesn't need us. I think by now we should all be aware of that. Every once in a while you'll hear somebody in frustration or anger tell somebody, so well, I don't even need you. And, and, and I know what uh, they're saying, or at least we should know what they're saying. They're saying, okay, uh, you know, I'm going to go on life, don't bother with me. But in actuality, uh, the only one in this whole earth that doesn't need anyone is Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, but yet his love uh, keeps him from consuming us. Uh, he doesn't need us. Uh, our goodness, matter of fact, Isaiah uh, 64 says, all of our goodness is as filthy rags. I thought about that. If our goodness is as filthy rags, how, how about our rottenness? You know, let's face it, we have the capability of being both good and rotten. And uh, sometimes we see it from the same person. Uh, but God's always good. So we want to be thankful for that. And the second thing we want to be thankful for is give thanks for God's power. Uh, read verse 4 and 9 with me. To him who alone does great wonders, once again, for his mercy endures forever, to him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by the night, for his mercy endures forever. You know, the heavens above and the earth below all declare his wisdom and power over all creation. Uh, I'm not sure, it was a couple months ago, uh, if you remember, there was a private uh, enterprise working with the federal government who set off a space launch. Uh, my wife and I, we were in a different town, they given the time that it was taking off, and, and we were driving across uh, 50 trying to get home, and, and the truth be known, I probably was exceeding the speed limit or two because I was wanting to get and watch this launch and we were so excited. And we did get there with a few minutes to spare. So we readied ourselves in front of the television and uh, much to my uh, surprise, uh, there was a narrator there. And the lady was narrating every stage of that space flight. And so, uh, as the spaceship was preparing to take off, she gave the seconds before the engines would be energized. And, and then uh, as it left its launch pad, uh, she told the exact time that one stage of the rocket would let loose. And, and uh, they had this thing, much to my amazement. Uh, now, rocket science isn't my major. <laughs> And, uh, but there are people with rocket science majors and the rocket scientists had made this flight so precise that this narrator, who I assume was not a rocket scientist, a highly articulate, well-stated person, but I, I'm convinced she didn't know much more about the inner workings of a rocket than I did. But she was reading the report word per word, and it was right every second. When she said in 14 seconds, uh, this part would engage, it happened. And this and that. Okay, so that flight was orderly. I mean, it was to the second. But here's, here's the thing. No one, not even the rocket scientists, could have given that flight order if there wasn't already established order by God. You see, uh, they knew the gravitational pull on the rocket. They knew the speed the rocket was going to be traveling. They knew the thrust that was needed because that uh, 
it was consistent all through creation. You know, if you went to one part of, of the country and driving your car and there was gravity that held you on inter whatever the interstate number is, and then you went to another state and there was no gravity because, uh, by the way, it just happens and unfortunately there isn't all the particulars uh, to make gravity. Now you know I'm saying that facetious. It doesn't just happen. Gravity is consistent. Loss of gravity is consistent. Seasons are consistent. Uh, uh, the sun coming up in the east is consistent. The moon, the, the stages of the moon, they can tell us solar eclipses decades from now. Uh, they'll tell you once in a while that, that you're going to see a certain star and this is the closest you're going to see it in your lifetime. How do they know all this? If, if everything just poof happened, because it didn't just happen. God created order. And there's so much order and his power holds it together. And that, that's what we're told. Uh, he gave us the sun. You know, I'll have to admit, during the summer, that sun doesn't seem very welcome to me sometimes, especially here in Indiana. Uh, Indiana not only has heat, it has humidity. Uh, and uh, you know, as well as I do, uh, you want to mow your garden or you want to, um, excuse me, mow your yard or hoe your garden, yeah, you do it by the calendar, uh, excuse me, by the clock. Uh, no one's saying, you know what? It's noon. I'm going to go out there and mow the yard. Not in August, not in Indiana. You can do it, but you're going to be panting and you're going to be sweating. Uh, and unless you've got a, an air-conditioned cab, you're not mowing it that time. I know in my own yard, it's not a large yard, but it takes a lot of, uh, th about three hours to get it mowed up. Well, I either do it before a certain time or I do it after a certain time. I'm not doing high heat. But I tell you, that even though the sun isn't welcome in August, we're in November and December, January, February is coming up. And I guarantee you, if I wake up on a morning and it's February and that sun's coming up and it's hanging high and, and it's going to shine bright all day, no clouds, no wind, there's going to be some comfort and heat, I'm going to welcome it. But, but it also is consistent that we're looking for the sun during the day and the moon for the night. How, how come? Because of God's power. You see, God's power, uh, some people fear God's power. God's power it would be a terrible thing if it wasn't for God's goodness. There's coming a day, and, and I've used this phrase before, uh, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ comes back to rule this earth, and he's going to be a benevolent dictator. He's going to be a dictator. It's not going to be a democracy. You're not going to get to tell God, well, you know, I don't really like that, that law. Let, let, let's go to committee and see what we're going to do. He's going to say, no, no, that ain't happening. That's not happening around here. But we don't fear his dictatorship because he's benevolent. He's loving. He cares for us. And, and, and so we see that. So the first thing we do is we give thanks for God's goodness. The second thing is we give thanks for God's power. And the third thing is we give thanks for God's purpose. God has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. You know, in Genesis, when he created, he was talking about the, the trees making seed and, of their kind and, and the birds of their kind. And, you know, we're having the seasons. Now, it's fall, uh, late fall, if you would. I would say it would be winter. And, uh, you know, those trees that were all green and, and lively just a few months ago. Now their leaves are either gone or they're dried up on the tree. And uh, they, the acorns and the nuts that those trees held, they've casted those on the ground. And some of those will go back to seed and be more trees. Some of those uh, will be consumed by animals. And, and, and we know how it all works. God has a purpose. And the truth of the matter is we're just entering this season, but it won't be long. Uh, you know, after a while, you realize how quick seasons travel. Won't be long. We'll be talking spring, and all those trees that are now bare will be uh, blooming out, little green sprouts and coming out. You, you see where I'm coming with this. So, uh, God has a unique purpose for all of His creation, uh, and 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 that would, of course, include you and me. He has a unique purpose for you. He really does. If you're listening to me right now, uh, you're, you're just not some abstract uh, being that just happens to, 
uh, eat a little food and breathe a little of this earth's air. God has a purpose for you. Uh, he is intended on that purpose being seen through and he cares for you. He created you in your mother's womb. Uh, you know, we hear people talking about uh, uh, different phrases and I've always stated there are no accidental births. There are several unplanned births. Now, we get that. Maybe, maybe you and your uh, spouse have talked about, okay, you know, we're done having children, only to find out there's one more coming. Or, or maybe, uh, maybe you, you were like, okay, I got this, uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to school, so you're getting ready to go to school, and you find out there's a child coming. Okay, those aren't planned. We get that. They're not planned, but they're not an accident. God fertilizes the womb. That's one of the reasons that we in the Christian community uh, uh, take a firm stand for the baby in the womb. Because God forms that baby and he has a purpose, a strong purpose. And so, uh, you know, we see that. Now, he makes everything work together. Isn't that interesting? And I'd like to read verse 10 through 22, lengthy reading. Uh, bear with me. Now, I want you to notice that after every verse, we hear the same phrase, his mercy endures forever. Uh, uh, the psalmist here, and we're not sure who this is. This is a, one of the psalms that are anonymous. Uh, whoever wrote it, we don't know. I'll tell you this much. If I wrote something of this quality, I'd put my name on it. <laughs> I, I, I got a little bit of ego problem, though. But, but wait, if I'd have penned this, I wanted everybody in the world to know, hey, that's Jim Lilly's thoughts. Uh, but, but I didn't, and it's probably the reason I don't pin things is I'm a little too proud. Uh, but, but read with me, if you would, verse 10 through 22. Uh, and we see that to him that smote Egypt and their firstborn, I'm going to leave out the phrase for his mercy endures forever, but after every phrase, that's what's being said. And he brought out Israel from among them with a strong hand, uh, he divided the Red Seas. He made Israel pass in the midst. He overthrew Pharaoh. Uh, uh, and it says, then, then it said, he, he led the people through the wilderness. He smote great kings. Uh, he slew famous kings. And, and, and we see all these phrases. Now you can finish reading that every time his mercy endures forever. And so what we see here is, is uh, God uh, had a purpose. He had a purpose for children of Israel. You know, I'd imagined if I'd have been one of the children of Israel. Can you, have you ever thought about them? Uh, they have been enslaved, uh, but when they got released, it was 430 years. So literally no one in Israel had ever been free. Their whole life had been uh, that of being a slave. Now, I imagine when you were born into a home, uh, your parents welcomed you, they loved you, they cared for you. Uh, but, but your dad didn't have hope. You know, I got hope for my children uh, that, that, uh, and my grandchildren. You know, they, they all are, are very intelligent and they all, uh, you know, have worked. Uh, they have a good work ethic. And, and so I have hope that, that, that they, they will get many opportunities in life, many opportunities to achieve many things that, that they would like to do. Uh, I have hope in that. But it... America, you can. America is a, a, an amazing land. Uh, a lot of people uh, miss the forest for the trees living in America. In America, uh, I was reading an article that 75% of the jobs, that means three out of every four jobs in America, you can have with an associate's degree or less. And, and that would include uh, training and trades. Uh, I was an operator engineer, so I know that trades, I know that uh, most people that go from uh, apprentice to journeyman, they too have been trained in, tra uh, trained in trades, and, and so they have what's equivalent to an associate. And, uh, uh, but if, if you have uh, a willingness uh, to better yourself in training and a willingness to work hard, uh, you have such opportunity here in America. Uh, you really do. And uh, so America is a land of opportunity, but in Israel, it wouldn't have been them, would it? They were slaves. A junior might have some muscles, but that just meant he had to work. Uh, Sissy may have been the smartest child in the whole neighborhood, but that just meant she had to be a slave. 
There was just no opportunity. And yet we see, because God had a purpose for Israel beyond being a slave, that he delivered them from then the most powerful uh, nation on the planet. So, so let's close this out. And so uh, we see that uh, we give thanks for God's goodness. We give thanks for God's power. We give thanks for God's purposes. And finally, we give thanks for God's provisions. Uh, look at verse 23 and 26 with me. Uh, many of you uh, planning on the, having a big meal tomorrow. And so we see how God feeds. Uh, you probably got the turkey thawing out right now. It's in the sink floating in the water, whatever they do with them. I'm not sure how you thaw a turkey. I just see it. Uh, uh, but, but you got your big meal planned tomorrow, and I hope you have a nice Thanksgiving with your family. And so let's look how God provides for us on a daily basis. Uh, verse 23 says, Who remember us in our lowest state, and hath redeemed us from our enemy, who gives food to all flesh. Uh, you know, God knows that we are mere flesh and bone, and he richly provides for us on a daily basis. Uh, God gives food to all flesh, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future, we can depend upon his provisions. And not just that. There's a psalm that says the ravens call out to him and he feeds them. The baby lions cry. You know, God uh, is concerned about his creation. He provides for his creation. And so... I, I don't know. I hope I gave you just a little primer to be thankful. Tomorrow you sit down with your family. Uh, maybe you just look across the table and tell them how, what you're thankful for. That would be, that'd be a wonderful exercise. Uh, we love you. Uh, you join us next Wednesday. We'll get back in our study in Philippians. I, I, it's my prayer that all of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And let's close in the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of the life you grant us. And Lord, we ask you to be each man, woman, and child that's watching tonight and be with our nation tomorrow as we celebrate with the spirit of thanksgiving. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.